All right, we're doing a pretty good job of staying on schedule here, and I'm glad that we are because there's a lot more to come and want to have everyone have their equal share of time. Dr. John Robbins is our next speaker. He holds a couple of titles besides doctor. He is president of the Trinity Foundation and director of development of the Doral Foundation on, uh, is it on uh, ba banking? Is that the, the general title of it? Yeah. And uh, many of you have probably read uh, Dr. Robbins' articles because he's written frequently for Gold Standard News. And, of course, he uh, publishes a lot of tracts on his own, and he is published in many other, uh, many other areas of the media in this country. And his topic is Money, Freedom, and the Bible, and he will give us a perspective that we haven't heard yet today. So I'd like you to welcome Dr. John Robbins. Thank you, Ernie. It seems odd to uh, 20th century secular men to suggest that the Bible has anything important to say about money and freedom. It seems even more odd to such men that we, to suggest that we ought to believe what the Bible says. The secular man has his bias, and I do not wish to argue against that bias here. I've done so in various other places, and what I wish to accomplish today is to give you some idea of what the Bible says about money and freedom and largely let the argument for believing what the Bible says remain for another place in time. Suffice it to say that in former times many men believed, as John Wycliffe expressed it, that all law, all philosophy, all logic, and all ethics are in Holy Scripture. In Holy Scripture is all truth. The modern age, of course, denies this. The modern age denies that there is such a thing as truth and asserts that if there were, the Bible ought to be the last document to be considered true. Even most persons calling themselves Christians deny that in Holy Scripture is all true. But it was a common opinion of former times. It was in those former times that many of the institutions that have granted us political and economic freedom and permitted us to prosper were created. They were not based upon secular assumptions. It is unlikely that in 1989 any representative group of men could be assembled within the United States who could draft a constitution for a government as carefully constructed as the one we now have. This is not because modern men are more ignorant than the men of the 18th century. As far as the quantity of information goes, the secular 20th century far surpasses the more Christian 18th. No, it is because modern men no longer believe what Americans of the 18th century believed. This is an important point in both talks I will give at this conference, and I wish to underscore it. Understanding what the Bible says about money and freedom, then, may help even modern men understand the foundations of the society in which they live. Money is mentioned frequently in the Bible. A quick look at a concordance indicates that the words money, weight, denarius, talent, etc., occur scores if not hundreds of times, and in most of the books of the Bible. Christ himself used money as illustrations in several of his parables. There is the parable of the talents, the parable of the woman who lost a silver coin, and of a man who found a treasure buried in a field. Christ used money as an illustration because nearly everyone is familiar with money, and nearly everyone places value upon it. In the story of the tribute money, when the Pharisees came to Christ trying to trick him and ask him whether it is lawful to pay taxes to Caesar, he spoke of the tribute money. The Greek word here translated money is the word from which we get our word numismatics, nomisma. A Greek word used in the New Testament, algerion, is translated both as silver and as money. A common word for money in the Old Testament was shekel, which was a standard measure of weight. After coins were invented, the name became attached to a coin in a process similar to the evolution of the British pound. Today, if I am not mistaken, the Israeli unit of account is the shekel. Although being a government creation, the modern shekel is not nearly as sound money as the market shekel of ancient Israel. As far as money goes, modern Israel is primitive and ancient Israel advanced. The talent in the Old Testament was a round weight of gold silver, or iron. In Israel, a talent weighed about 75 pounds. 
The mina weighed 50 or 60 shekels, and 60 minas equaled a talent. Of the smaller weights, the pim equaled about two-thirds of a shekel, the beka about half a shekel, and the gira about one-twentieth of a shekel. In New Testament times, the talent varied significantly in weight, although its average seemed to be about 75 pounds. At least one Roman coin is mentioned in the New Testament, the denarius, which was a silver coin worth about 18 cents. It was the common daily wage for the common man. The Emperor Nero showed his contempt for the common man, even while he was showing his hatred for Christians by using them as torches to light his garden parties, by debasing the denarius until it was worth less than half its value when he took power. It was the denarius that Christ spoke of when he said, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Those who think that the use of gold or silver evolved relatively late in human history might learn something from the history of Abraham. About 2,000 years before Christ, he paid for a field by weighing out 400 shekels of silver. The account is given in Genesis 23, and I'd like to read one verse from that chapter because it bears on the question of the origin of money. The verse is, And Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out the silver for Ephron, which he had named in the hearing of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, currency of the merchants. It does not say currency of the government. It says currency of the merchants. Money originated in the market. There does not appear to be any evidence of coins appearing in Israel, however, much before they did in Lydia. Our concern, however, is not the study of the parables alone or the passages in which coins are mentioned. For while they may be of historical interest, they are not normative for us today. Just because ancient Israel used gold and silver as money, we are not required to do so, any more than our weights are required to be named talent, mina, and shekel. What we must do is understand how the Bible as a whole regards money, and specifically how it views the relationship between money and government. Is it a function of government to manufacture money, according to the Bible? Should government have the freedom to issue money? The answers to these questions may surprise a lot of people, including secular men who get their information about the Bible, second or third hand, never having actually read the book themselves. I would like to use as a foil for my remarks today a book published in 1986 by Gary North, a name that be, may be familiar to many of you. In that year, he wrote Honest Money, the Biblical Blueprint for Money and Banking. In considering what North says and comparing it with what the Bible says, we may be able to get a good grasp of what the Bible has to say about money. In a section entitled The Most Marketable Econ Commodity, North makes an excellent point. He says, and I quote, There is nothing in the Bible that indicates that gold and silver became money metals because Abraham, Moses, David, or any other political leader announced one afternoon from now on, gold is money. The state did not create money. This is quite true. The Bible is the oldest and most reliable history book we have, and there is nothing in it to indicate that the state originally created money. Rather, the evidence is that stamped money and coins originated in the market when merchants offered their own coins in trade. This historical argument from the Old Testament an argument that supports the idea that the origin of money was the market, not a government decree, is complemented by a moral argument from the New Testament. In the 13th chapter of Romans, the Apostle Paul gives one and only one purpose of government. He writes, and I quote, The ruler is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer, unquote. Paul does not regard government as provider of income, health care, education, money, or any of the other services common to our modern welfare state. Its function is quite simple, to punish wrongdoers. Exactly which wrongs to punish and which punishments to impose must be settled by appeals to other biblical texts. But it is clear that Paul has something in mind very much like the much despised night watchman state of 19th century liberalism. This is a major teaching of the Bible about money. 
The Bible, again, is our most reliable and oldest historical history book, and it indicates that money did not develop, at least in Israel, from government action, but from the market. Second, in the New Testament, this lack of participation by the government in furnishing money is reinforced by Paul's failure to include management of monetary policy as one of the purposes of government. Dr. North, unfortunately, even though he seems to understand the view just described, nevertheless advocates policies that contradict it. For example, on page 126 of his book, he urges the minting of, quote, every ounce, unquote, of the federal government's gold stockpile into small gold coins. Now, the government owns approximately 263 million ounces of gold. If that stockpile were minted into one-half ounce coins, there would be 526 million such coins on the market, a number far greater than the total number of gold coins minted by the U.S. government from its inception until 1988. How such an enormous number would be sold is a mystery, and Dr. North seems to see the problem. For further down on the same page, he makes this proposal, and I quote, simply take the 265 million ounces of gold, melt the gold into one quarter ounce gold coins, and send four per person to every U.S. citizen. Any coins left over could then be sold, unquote. It is likely that a market glut like that would simply result in a massive coin melt. I must say, however, that a letter from Gary North as Secretary of the Treasury would be received far more enthusiastically than any number of letters from Ed McMahon promising a million dollars. <laughs> of course, understanding how things work in Washington, it would be the members of Congress who would mail the coins out, not the Secretary of the Treasury, and they would each take credit for this great coin giveaway. What is more important, however, is that Dr. North advocates getting the government into the gold coin business in a big way. Had he stuck to the biblical blueprint, he would have advocated the denationalization of the government's gold stock as is, auctioning the ingots off to the highest bidders, and not a massive new coinage program that far exceeds the capacity of the U.S. Mint. What is worse, I suppose, or at least equally bad, is Dr. North's proposal for dealing with the debt problem. He writes, and I quote, we tell the bankers, all right, boys, we all know the mess you're in. You are sitting on top of a mountain of bad debts. You want out. The U.S. government is here to help you weather the storm. We will do a swap. You sell us your pile of Mexican and Brazilian bonds, and we will give you nice, safe 90-day treasury bills in exchange. You get your portfolios liquid again. We will take all that lousy debt you're sitting on, which you know will never be paid off, and you get in its place interest-paying T-bills. You can even sell them if you want. There's a market for them. This would bail out the big banks. What about the small rural banks? What's in it for them? Give them the same deal with any remaining T-bills. Swap their lousy farm mortgages for nice liquid T-bills. End of quote. All of this comes under the heading Increased Reserve Requirements. Dr. North is a proponent of 100% reserve requirements and this bailout of the entire banking system is the quid pro quo for imposing increasing reserve requirements on the banks, 5% more each year for 20 years, he suggests, until we achieve, quote, the reestablishment of honest 100% reserve banking, unquote. Unfortunately, there isn't anything in the Bible legitimizing such massive government bailouts of banks as we have already seen. Dr. North has strayed far from the biblical blueprint for money and banking in his proposals. The reason is not simply that he is ignoring what the Bible says about the role of government, but also that he misunderstands what the Bible says about money and banking. Nowhere does the Bible condemn fractional reserve banking. Nowhere is government given the authority to regulate reserve requirements. When pressed on this point, Dr. North refers to one passage of scripture which reads, and I quote, if you ever take your neighbor's garment as a pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. For that is his only covering. It is his garment for his skin. What will he sleep in? And it will be that when he cries to me, I will hear, for I am gracious. That's a passage from Exodus chapter 22. That is the only passage in the Bible that Dr. North has found that he says condemns fractional reserve banking. 
Unfortunately, the passage has little to do with banking and nothing to do with fractional reserves. North himself admits that the context of this verse is the general prohibition of interest taken from a poor fellow believer. This is not a business loan, unquote. Therefore, the biblical blueprint for money and banking does not include any condemnation of fractional reserve banking. The distinction that North is making here, even though the passage is irrelevant to fractional reserve banking, is a useful and legitimate distinction the distinction between charity loans and business loans. The failure to recognize this distinction in what the Bible teaches has led some to conclude that the Bible condemns all interest-taking as immoral and implies that it should be illegal as well. North does not make that mistake. He makes another. According to the Bible, taking interest on business loans is not immoral, but taking interest on charity loans is. After all, charity loans are supposed to be just that, charity. What many, although not North, sometimes fail to realize is that not everything the Bible condemns as immoral, it does not intend to make illegal. Those sins that are also crimes are made clear in the Old Testament by the imposition of civil penalties for the crime. If there is no penalty imposed, then the action, however immoral, is not a crime. Oddly enough, North realizes this, but the proposals he advocates contradict what he understands the Bible to teach. Once again, he has wandered from the biblical blueprint for money and banking. Taking interest on business loans is neither a crime nor a sin. Taking interest on charity loans, while a sin, is not a crime. Therefore, there is no support whatsoever in Scripture for usury laws or laws regulating bank reserve requirements. On another page, North confuses bank deposit books with warehouse receipts. The two are quite different. For one thing, a warehouse does not pay interest on things left on deposit. Rather, the depositor pays the warehouse for the service it is performing. Second, a person using a warehouse expects to receive exactly what he deposited. No bank customer expects to receive exactly what he deposited. He does not expect to withdraw Federal Reserve notes with the same serial numbers that he deposited. Nor does he expect to receive in return the checks that he deposited either. He expects to receive either currency or a good check for the same number of monetary units plus interest that he deposited according to the terms under which the deposit was made. Only if he does not, or only if the banks obtains additional monetary units by political rather than economic means, is there any warrant for including, accusing the bank of fraud? A third difference between banks and warehouses appears in that many banks are in the warehousing business, in addition to being in the banking business. They rent safe deposit boxes. The difference between banking and warehousing seems implicit in Christ's parable of the talents, and I will read this entire parable. The kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, to another one talent, each according to his ability. And if there are any Marxists present, I hope you'll notice that. <laughs> and also the end of the parable, it will even uh, make Marxists more infuriated. <laughs> then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Sounds like some gold investors I know. <laughs> After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. 
I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered abroad. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you know that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw the worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It seems that the worthless servant warehoused his talent, when he should at least have banked it, if not have invested in the stock market. For that he was condemned to darkness and weeping. This particular passage of scripture incidentally makes a point that I mentioned earlier and that bears repeating. Money in the Bible is a weight of metal. A talent was a certain weight of silver. Now this historical fact does not require money to be a weight of silver or even of metal. An ought cannot be derived from an is, despite what some empiricists tell us. Of course, one of the greatest empiricists, David Hume, recognized quite clearly the illogicality of trying to derive an imperative sentence from a statement of fact. But it does lead to another major teaching of the Bible on money. If money consists of weights, and throughout history it usually has, then the money must be full-bodied. Less than honest weights constitute fraud. There are several passages on this point in the Bible, and I will read a few briefly. You shall do no injustice in judgment, in measurement of length, weight, or volume. You shall have just balances, just weights, a just ephah, and a just hin. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. The Lord abhors dishonest scales, but accurate rate weights are his delight. The Lord detests differing weights, and dishonest scales do not please him. Do not have two differing weights in your bag, one heavy, one light. Do not have two differing measures in your home, one large, one small. You must have accurate and honest weights and measures so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. Any use of fraudulent weights was subject to the penalties imposed for theft, at least double restitution, with the ultimate pen penalty being required for recidivism. But again it would seem that there were no regulatory police in ancient Israel. The buyers and sellers were responsible for making sure that they were not being cheated, and if detected in fraud, a person was subject to stiff penalties. Biblical law follows the principle of punishing wrongdoers rather than trying to regulate everyone in the hope of preventing wrongdoing. One thing that follows from the restricted biblical role of government with regard to money and banking is the absence of legal tender laws. I wish to make clear what I mean by legal tender, since it seems to have at least two quite different meanings. Of course, if a government is to collect taxes or payments of any sort, it must specify an acceptable form of payment. This is one meaning of the phrase legal tender. In the early years of the American Republic, this problem was solved by the government publishing a list of monies that would it, it would accept as payment. It did not restrict payment to one form of money, but published a rather long list of acceptable forms of payment. One of the reforms that we can advocate is that the government of the United States publish such an extensive list again in fact, that the government publish a list permitting payments not only in monies denominated in dollars, but in monies denominated in ounces, grams, yen, marks, gold standard units, or what have you. One of the greatest obstacles, I might add as an aside here, to monetary freedom is the tax system of the government, which requires accounts be kept in dollars, and dollars are usually thought of as Federal Reserve notes and the deposits in the uh, Federal Reserve banking cartel. If the government were to publish a list of monies that would be acceptable in for, in, as payment of taxes, uh, then that would be a major step toward monetary freedom. But there is another meaning of the phrase legal tender. 
Usually it means that a creditor is compelled to, to accept whatever the government has declared to be tender as payment for outstanding debts. Each Federal Reserve note bears the words, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Those words mean that a creditor must accept them in payment. It makes little difference that the creditor may have a contract calling for payment in something else, for the courts do not, as a rule, order specific performance of contracts in 1989. Perhaps at one time they did, but today a creditor is compelled to accept the government paper as payment. There is no warrant for this sort of legal tender in the Bible. Rather, the clear implication is that the parties to a contract may set the terms of the contract so long as they are not illegal in themselves, and those terms must be abided by. The Bible praises the man who makes a promise and keeps it, even though he might be injured by keeping it. It condemns the man who welshes on a deal, or seeks to substitute something of lesser value than that which he promised to deliver. Legal tender laws are an institutionalized form of welshing on debt. Finally, there is another aspect of money in the Bible that we ought to consider. Money is mammon. Everyone knows that the Bible strongly condemns mammon, and many people equate mammon with money, thereby concluding that the Bible and Christianity are hostile to money. The two, however, are not the same. Mammon is money worshipped. That is why Christ said you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is money become an idol, and even the most beneficial things can become instruments of destruction if they are regarded more highly than they ought to be. The Bible condemns all forms of idolatry, including the idolatry of money. Ayn Rand did not understand that when she wrote her books, but I'm sure she has a better understanding of it now. <laughs> in conclusion, what can we say about money, freedom, and the Bible? I'd simply like to suggest that the men who lived two centuries ago had a better understanding of money and freedom because they understood the Bible better than we do today. We are singularly blessed to live under a document that is largely based on the principles of government found in the Bible. And if we wish to restore monetary freedom, we will once again have to understand and believe the Bible. Without that theological and philosophical foundation, monetary freedom and freedom in general can be only a temporary phenomenon. Thank you. We have time for about 20 minutes worth of questions, which is what the original plan was for all of the speakers, and uh, I'm sure many of you do, so same format as before. And we'll try to take as many different questions as possible before we get to repeat questions. Okay, go ahead, sir. Have you read uh, similar uh, events or whatever in the other theologies? Similar events? Uh, similar. He wanted his assets unfrozen in, in the U.S. Um, I wonder if he cares a comment on that, because I'm not an expert. On, on the Ayatollah wanting his assets unfrozen? to bring it up, but not in those uh, views that, that indeed endure have a common component in terms of demanding a lot of money. Uh, this is a, uh, quite, it, it seems to be quite universal. Uh, I, I would think that I, I, hate to bring it up, but one of the, the current demands, the Ayatollah, for instance, one of the things he wants is his assets unfrozen in, in the U.S. Um, I wonder if he cares a comment on that, because I, I'm not an expert. But, uh, on, on the Ayatollah wanting his assets unfrozen? It strikes me that, that uh, human society, social... Uh, Organizations demand that there be trust in money and honest money. Absolutely. And uh, uh, I don't see how any views could sur long survive without that requirement. The the requirement of trust is is fundamental. I hope to touch on that in my uh, talk tomorrow and uh, quote Milton Friedman on the point, who cannot be accused of being a Christian. Uh, <laughs> and because it is fundamental to the functioning of any a complex society or any money system. And the, the question is, okay, how do we achieve that level of trust? And can that be achieved without the basis of the Christian ethic? 
That's the question. Yes, sir. Well, what do you say about federal deposit insurance? The federal liability to make your goods to all these deposits, the money lost by banks and federal dollars. It's a commitment. Uh, a federal deposit insurance. Would you pay off? Would I pay off? Should uh, it pay off? No, I don't think it should. Um, and my reason for that is that in order to pay off, it will have to create the money to pay off. In order to keep its promise, it has to do a wrong. And any promise that requires the doing of wrong is a promise that uh, ought not to have been made. I think that's an excellent answer. Thank you, sir. In the back, please. Mine is more a comment than a question. Uh, although it wasn't uh, explicitly expressed uh, by you, I thought I saw a beautiful analogy between uh, the scripture and uh, precious metals. Uh, I think our our, uh, as our money has been debased uh, by uh, uh, pulling away from backing of uh, uh, precious metals. I think our conventional wisdom of today has been debased by pulling away from the scriptures as, uh, as backing. Uh, my, my profession is law, and uh, in uh, uh, reflecting on some of the statutes that were on the books uh, back when our Constitution was founded. Uh, uh, you go back to some of the uh, statutes in uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts at that time, and uh, you would read almost word for word from Leviticus uh, for the, the statutes of the Commonwealth, and uh, I'm afraid we've gone a long ways from that today uh, down to where uh, it's, uh, it feels good to do it. Uh, it's sort of the, the conventional wisdom. And, uh, I, I thought that was a beautiful analogy. It appeared to me anyway, even though maybe you didn't intend it. <laughs> Thank you. Speaking of Massachusetts, uh, <laughs> 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 Massachusetts is an interesting case because, uh, as Dr. Senholtz pointed out earlier, the earliest currency reform in the U.S. occurred in Massachusetts. Back in 1690, the government of Massachusetts was the first government to issue uh, paper money and to make it legal tender. So on the one hand, you have this almost schizophrenic form of government where they rely on scripture in detail in some cases, as you've pointed out, and in other cases, they go off on completely different tangents and print money and make it legal tender and have currency reforms. And unfortunately, it's it's those latter cases that, uh, uh, that Massachusetts gained its notoriety for in many cases. Yes, sir. One comment, uh, this bears on an article that was in the Wall Street Journal maybe a year or a year and a half ago, going back to an earlier point, but a number of writers have made the case that one reason that we see such a lack of progress in modern Arab society and Persian society is precisely because of the adoption of Islam. And one of the main points made in this article I read was that Islam has so many prohibitions against what we would define as capitalist premises. And these premises which were implicit in much of Arab culture prior to the rise of Muhammad, when the Old Testament uh, and, and other precepts of Christianity still held sway over a great deal of Arab society. Those were lost uh, with the, introdu the introduction of Islam. And uh, if, if anybody's interested in looking up that article, and I think there were a couple of others uh, around the same time, it's very, very interesting reading because it takes back to some fundamentals. This deals with a question that came up earlier about what other religions might teach. It is my understanding that one of the teachings of Islam is that all interest-taking is immoral. Right. And uh, uh, Islamic banks are built around that principle, that all interest-taking is immoral. Yes, is there anything? Than charity, no one would win. Is it? That's, that, is the, that is the tendency of the system, yes. Yes, sir, in the back. How do you feel about the year of Jubilee that was pronounced in the Old Testament? My position on the Old Testament law is the uh, historical Presbyterian position of the Westminster Confession, chapter 19, that all the ceremonial laws have been abrogated uh, with the life and death and resurrection of Christ. All the judicial laws have been abrogated except insofar as they, the general equity of them require a perpetual obedience, and it is only the moral law that binds every man uh, to full 
and perpetual obedience. So the law of Jubilee is gone. Uh, that ended at the uh, resurrection of Christ. Uh, incidentally, uh, there's no record of ancient Israel ever observing the law of Jubilee throughout the Old Testament. The law was on the books, but it was never observed. Be better for these, right? Yes. Any other? In the back, please. I uh, was fascinated with one point that you made where you, you observed in, in the Old Testament every uh, moral principle is not translated into a civil law or a penal, civil penalty. Uh, that seems to be something that escapes uh, most, most everyone. <laughs> Could you expand on that? Uh, what, what is your? Do you have a further? Do you have a, a proactive uh, basis in scripture? Or? Well, the the Bible the Bible condemns many things as sins. Uh, that it does not give the authority to civil government to punish. The things that it gives the authority to civil government to punish are specifically uh, listed when there are civil penalties involved. If there is no civil penalty, we can only conclude that although this particular action or thought uh, is immoral, government has no right to punish him. I think it's important that Paul said that the purpose of the ruler is to punish wrongdoers, not wrong thinkers. He says wrongdoers. I think every word is important. And uh, there you have the beginning of the idea of freedom of opinion, freedom of conscience. Just as when Christ said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar and unto God the things that are God, you have for the first time a challenge to the totalitarian state of Greece and Rome. Up to then, everything was Caesar's. Everything was rendered to Caesar, or everything was rendered to the polis. The, the polis could kill Socrates for corrupting the youth of Athens. But Christ first made the distinction, he said, some things are Caesar's and some things are not Caesar's, and we're to render to each what is his due. Any other questions? Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, well, like many of your main churches are, let's say, there seems to be a lack of respect for economic you know, say freedom, or we our property rights, or we consider property rights. And obviously, we've got to talk about monetary rights, you have to have property rights. And my question is twofold, number one, how does one, and is there any hope of mainstream churches to change in the school of theology away from the liberation theology or whatever else seems to be predominant to a more freedom oriented way of thinking about the world? And to where does one go to the church because many churches are very influential on many people's lives? Well, so long as God is God, there's hope for anyone's conversion, <laughs> in, including some of the uh, churchmen in the United States. And some of them may be converted, who knows, to Christianity. <laughs> um, I, I don't know how to answer the question except that uh, anyone who believes the Bible is, uh, uh, has the duty of teaching what it believes and uh, expounding it or uh, expressing those views wherever he can, whether it's at a conference like this or at, uh, just in talking to your neighbor. And it's only in that one-to-one -one contact that there's going to be any change made uh, for the better. I have little hope for mass movements or, or mass evangelism or anything of that sort. I, I would like to say and invite you Sunday afternoon at my home at 2 o'clock. John will be speaking and there will be a discussion about men and family in the church. And anyone here that wishes to come is invited to come. And I'll, I'll, I'll make some handouts to pass out if you'd like to come. Anyone else? Yes, sir. I think it's rather interesting that uh, that uh, the, the two commandments in the Bible against coveting, but there's never any penalty against coveting. No civil penalty against coveting. I don't recall any offhand, sir. Which makes your point that uh, the fact that something is sin is not necessarily meant to make it uh, punishable by, by government. It, it's very important to keep in mind the difference between sins and crimes. Yes. Maybe you could expand a little bit, John, on, again, on the churches. Uh, I think maybe where the air seems to be is that the churches and Christians in general concentrate on doing good and at the expense of the Christian message of grace. You mean social action? 
Well, and liberation kind of, theology. Kind of good, but basically, they, rather than than simply, you know, God's given us certain negative commands, but it gives us total freedom. Mm-hmm. Rather than saying, this is what you've got to do, and we're going to make you do it this way, so that you're a good person or something. Mm-hmm. Well, I think the many of the churches have bought into a um, a gospel of, if not uh, state action, then at least a social or political action whereby we can achieve the kingdom of God on earth uh, by going out and uh, either lobbying for more welfare programs or uh, engaging in welfare programs ourselves. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons for the, uh, the gentleman's comment here about uh, uh, how can we, is there any hope for the churches in understanding the Bible if all they can concentrate on is action, political and social action? And it's that I have nothing against political and social action so as it, so long as it doesn't involve increasing the government's power. And if, if individuals want to engage in such things on their own, that's, that's fine. The, the problem comes in when they engage the churches as an institution in such actions, and the church then stops doing what it's supposed to be doing, which is teaching what the Bible teaches, and starts doing what it's not supposed to be doing, and that's uh, lobbying for more money from Washington or organizing the uh, grape workers or, or whatever the case may be. Yes, sir. You are president of Trinity Foundation. The name rings a bell, but I just can't put it We publish uh, books. There are several books on the back table there by uh, Gordon Clark, who I freely admit is the fountainhead for virtually all of my ideas. All of my ideas are stolen. Um, and uh, if you wish to read a Christian philosopher and theologian who is first class, please read his books. He has a uh, history of philosophy, which is the best one-volume history of philosophy in English, period. It's called Thales to Dewey. There's a copy of it on the back table. Now, there are very good histories of philosophy, but, uh, for instance, uh, Copleston, the Jesuit priest, has a history of philosophy in about 16 volumes. Excellent. Uh, so I, I notice I said one volume in English. And uh, it was a college text for years in both Christian and secular colleges, and we've just brought it back into print. It was written about 30 years ago. Uh, and there are other books dealing with uh, similar philosophical and theological issues. We've published probably 25 books in the past uh, eight or nine years. We publish an occasional newsletter called the Trinity Review. Uh, other than that, that if you will leave your name and address, I'll be glad to put you on, sir. Uh, yes, comments sir. on a few remarks about Dr. Gary North. Uh, what you have said about his attitude toward money doesn't surprise me, because in the field of defense, which is my specialty, uh, Dr. North's name comes up a lot because he's active in the civil defense movement. He wrote a book some time ago called Fighting Champ, along with Dr. Arthur Robinson. And in that book, he advocates much the same kind of principle for defense as he does for money in the area of banking and and, uh, monetary theory. He believes that, for instance, we need to have a crash two-year program that would cost, according to his estimates, about $150 billion of money for us from taxpayers in order to build a civil defense shelter system. His reasoning for that is that we need to preserve freedom because otherwise it will be taken away from us by Russia because we would be at this severe strategic disadvantage. So uh, I guess my point is is that I'm, I'm wary of the man even though he says that he is a free market advocate because in principle after principle I have seen him actually turn around and advocate things that are gross violations. But it's, I don't know why. I, I don't know why either unless he has... Uh predisposition toward government action. I benefited from reading Gary North a great deal, and also his mentor, uh, Rush Dooney. Um, but in this particular book on money and banking, I haven't read Fighting Chance, or anything, but in this particular book, Money and Banking, he will make an excellent point, such as the distinction between business and charity loans, or money being uh, a product of the market rather than of government, and then turn around and in his policy proposals, simply ignore everything he said earlier. Yes, sir. I concur with that. Um, the first half of the book, under principle, most of it is very accurate and well thought out. The second half, under reconstruction of the system, you just cut it out and throw it away. It's, mm-hmm. uh, it's virtually worthless. 
you know, all advocates greater government role in solving the problem it helped create in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, uh, this gets back to almost to the, an earlier question about uh, social action, political action. Gary is uh, a leader of a movement that aims to reconstruct society, and I think he has almost bought into the idea that political action can achieve something that ought to be achieved by persuasion. Uh, if any, any good is going to be achieved in, in this room or as a result of the meeting here today, it's going to be through persuasion, not through lobbying for more government intervention in money and banking. There is nothing, for example, that prevents an average uh, middle-class American from building his own shelter for about the price of a used car. So mm -hmm. private market action is totally open to mm -hmm. anyone who wants to take it. And I, my impression is that Dr. North is frustrated by the fact that persuasion hasn't gone any farther any faster than it has, so we're going to have to intervene to step up the prospect. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, sir. I take it you're opposed to reconstruction theology. And then uh, when they begin substituting uh, coercion for persuasion, I am. Otherwise, I would say that I agree uh, very much with some of the things they say. It's, it's just that I'm a little bit uh, frightened by some of their proposals for political action. Okay. I there maybe one more. Okay. One more? Yes, sir. The foundation, again, uh, it is primarily for publishing? Yes, it is. And in the broad